Sorry, guys, just takes a second to load. You're off the orange. That's a picture of the pink here. That's, I don't know if it's the top or the bottom shade, but um, mm -hmm. you just paint the lighter shade, and then the darker shade you make mm -hmm. and have water. So yeah, um, we're now I just put it on um, YouTube. So hopefully we'll be able to. I'll send the link to Broccoli. But thanks, thanks for joining us today. This is Susan McElroy. For those that don't know Susan, she works with us as well. She looks lovely in red today. Um, I don't have red. I've got crimson. That's about as good as I could get. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to run through some wines. We're mainly going to talk about Cabernet, as Brock alluded to. But I've got some videos and some photos and things. But we can keep it pretty informal. So just if you want to interrupt, just go ahead. You're all off. Just come off mute for those who are on mute and um, fire away. So the first wine that um, we, we're we showing is the Chardonnay. So these are the wines that we're going to run through today. Um, so mainly it's, it's a, we're going to do one white wine and then we're going to do it like a bunch of reds. So this is my family. These are my five kids that... Um, this is my front yard, and I make wines with my daughters. Um, some of you guys know that already, but I also have a couple of sons. I just don't make wines with boys. Um, <laughs> boys I don't make wines with boys' names, dogs, or blue labels, none of that. So uh, the, the singing tree that we're going to show today is the is the Dutton Chardonnay, which is pretty rare. So where I'm sitting right now is the center of the universe, which is uh, right here in Healdsburg. We're about an hour and a half, well, an hour north of the Golden Gate Bridge. And there's about 280 wineries here uh, because this is Dry Creek, this is Alexander Valley, this is Chalk Hill, and this is Russian River. And so we're, the four Appalachians meet in Healdsburg and where we are talking is the southern part. Sorry, no. we're going to be talking about Tutton, which is in the Green Valley Appalachian, which is the coldest part of Russian River. The key elements mainly is that it's on a Goldridge Sandy Loam soil because it's and because it's there, it's a super old vineyard. We often talk about old vine Zinfandel or old vine Cabernet, but we very rarely talk about old vine Chardonnay. And that's because most of the Chardonnays were replanted in 89 and 90 due to phylloxera, and they planted clones. And we do not plant clones. I'm not interested in making wines with clones because we're, the definition of a clone is everything comes from one plant. You can track everything back to one plant. And that's why today most of the Chardonnays taste the same. But this Chardonnay doesn't because it comes from an old mass selection or field selection, which is a bunch of cuttings that were taken around in some of the older Chardonnays in the 60s and 70s. There's not many of these vineyards left, but this is one of them. It's also a very special uh, vineyard because it's one I've been working on for 30 years now. So this is owned by, was originally owned by Warren Dutton. He passed away and he left it into his two sons. And so I work with his two sons now. And Dutton's quite a famous name when it comes to uh, Chardonnay in the Russian River. So Particularly old vine, as you can see, um, these were planted in the 70s. <clears throat> and this is a photo of a, a, a field selection Chardonnay, not a clone. If this was a clone, all the berries would be the same uh, size and that'll be, it'll be a very tight cluster. And this is the Goldridge sandy loam that they live on. So the phylloxera cannot live in the soil because it's, there's very little organic matter. And then in the winery, it's, um, well, we won't talk too much about that, but stylistically, most Chardonnay today sort of has this white peach character, you know, a little bit of structure, a little bit of texture, not too warm, not pineapple or melon or not too citrusy or grassy, but sort of somewhere in the middle. And that's why Chardonnay really has become fairly boring. But the two styles of Chardonnay that we make, uh, the Singing Tree, which we're not talking about today, but the Singing Tree Reserve has a lot more texture to it. So it's fuller, lusher. And it has some of the subtropical, like pineapple characters and things like that, that you can sort of see in the background. So it makes the wine a little bit more interesting and more complex. So uh, this is a video of Nicole's this video. video. Hopefully you can hear this. Reserve Chardonnay, which comes from the Dutton Ranch. Check out this man, 1974 planting on uh, AXR1 rootstock. And the reason why it lives here is because we have the Goldridge Sandy Loam which is this, you know, this, uh, this, powdery, this powdery soil that the phylloxera can't live in. Fantastic old vine, grown on an old, old trellis system. I'm checking it out, looking up. And if you can see this cluster here, for instance, we've got big berries and small berries in the same cluster. Really unique. Oh man, I'm standing under the shade now, this is great. Uh, but these uh, old mass selections give you more mineral and graphite and 
you get some passion fruit and a little bit of melon, but you don't get sort of the white peach and, and pear that you get from the Dijon and UC Davis clones, because those wines, they all taste the same. But these old mass selections are really unique. And What's that? Okay. What was that, Brock? I, I, I didn't see anything. Sorry. Okay. You didn't see the video? No, I saw the video. Yep. Okay. So, uh, yeah, this is a super old vine. This was the Dutton 17 that you guys are trying, and uh, it's, it's quite unique. So what do you guys think? You know, I was really not surprised when you said this was an uh, older vine or a different vine because when I tried it, that's what I thought. I thought this is broader than most Chardonnays I've tried. Yeah. Sure. It's, um, there's, as I said, there's not many of these vineyards left. I mean, when I was a winemaker at Simi Winery for 15 years, I mean, we probably purchased from about 40 growers. And of those 40 growers, I can only name you two that did not replant. Um, so unfortunately, these Dijon clones, you, they talk, you probably don't know, but they talk about Dijon 76 and 95 and 90, but they all taste the same because they can. You, you, you can go to one plant and whereas these old field selections, you know, back in the 60s and 70s, you, di you didn't go down to the plant nursery like you do today. You had to make these things yourself. And so you'd go out into the vineyard and you'd take a, a piece of budwood. Um, my dog chewed on one here these days. Yeah. My dog had a bit of a feast on this one. Um, but you can take a cane like this and you'll, um, uh, we'll, we'll t we take uh, three buds and we'll put this in the cool room over the winter, the and, winter then, and then in the spring we'll bring it out and we get a knife and we chip the bud out and then we take the rootstock which I talked about was AXR1 you make a little tea in the in the bark and you peel back the bark and you'll expose the cambium layer and then you take that bud and you slip it in you can grow chardonnay I used to put I used to put peaches on the pear tree, apples on the nectarine tree and stuff like that when I was a kid. I know you guys were all watching television, but in New Zealand, that's what we did. <laughs> and uh, my mum would come in and go, what the hell's going on, you know? <laughs> and um, But you can, you can do that. You can, And that's how we grew Chardonnay back in the 60s, 70s and most of the 80s until, until the cloning came around. The UC Davis clones were the first ones. Uh, and then uh, the Dijon clones sort of came out in like the mid '90s. They were supposedly a little bit more tropical, but the reality, the fact is that they grow because land is so expensive and water is so expensive. The, the main impetus for cloning, and this is true for Cabernet as well, is that they can produce a large crop and they can ripen it. So this is, and then that was the advent of high alcohol Cabernet and things like that. So. We can, instead of cropping at four ton an acre, we can get eight ton an acre. And instead of picking it at 22, 23 bricks, we can pick at 25, 26 bricks. So that's when the style, I, I, I'm convinced that the style of the wines really changed with, um, with unfortunately, the takeover of Phylloxera on the AX01 rootstock. Yeah, cool. that's definitely interesting. You know, I'm thinking about, you know, just, you know, in, in Wisconsin about how, uh, you know, we have, 60 day corn and 90 day corn, you know, and you know, like you, you harvest that baby on 60 days, you harvest that baby on 90 days. And, you know, when you go back to more of those heirloom styles of, you know, corn and tomatoes and, you know, the, the flavor profiles are so, so different. And that, that's why I think this, this one is so fun to talk about. Um, with, with this vintage, did you do um, part of it in neutral barrels and then part of it in um, new barrels and blend it together? Or yes. Yeah, that's what I did. So, you know, and I changed the percent of new oak. So it depends on the vintage. 17 was a particularly good vintage because um, it has um, a little bit better natural acidity, whereas 18 is a bit more flashy. So okay. I used less new wood on the 17. I used a bit more on the 18 because 17, I don't know. The, the big thing for me is when you drink that wine, you, 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 your mouth goes, and you go, shit, man, am I hungry or thirsty? And that's, uh, that's what I try to get into wine, you know, it's especially, you know, you've you got to have a certain amount of tension in the wine itself. So you've got to have that, you know, because, I mean, we can all sell the first glass, even you, Brock. I mean, it's, I selling, it's, it's, selling the, uh, it's selling the second glass that's tricky. Like, do you want to go back and have that second glass, you know? And so, you know, the, the measurement for success for me is when you're standing in a restaurant and someone yells out, I'll have a glass of Chardonnay. You're standing at the bar, right? They pour them a Chardonnay. 
and you finish that and you go, what else you got? That's not good. Uh, you know, yeah. it's like I have the same again as a much better um, advoc advocation for the, for the product, you know. All right, you ready for cab? We are. All right, so the first, uh, yeah, you guys are in, man. What is it, lunchtime there now? <laughs> so, um, 11.42. We make a lot of Cabernets. So today we're going to talk about these five. <laughs> so on the Napa Valley, we mainly focus on Oakville, but we also have um, we also have one that just purely Napa Valley, which we're going to try first, and then we're going to try um, two from the Alexander Valley. So the first one is, is the key elements for Cabernet for me are east facing. So east facing is really important because it's morning sun. West facing is afternoon sun. So you can imagine that if you get the morning sun, it's going to be less strong in heat because we often get fog in the morning. So, you know, we get fog in the Alexander Valley and the Napa Valley then normally burns off at about 10 or 11 in the morning. So we've already lost half of the morning heat. So that's important to us to extend the hang time and therefore to get better flavor and tannin maturity along with just sugar. Um, we, we pick it a little bit. I'm pushing earlier harvests all the time. In fact, this year we got, for, for my clients consulting, we had a couple of hundred point wines and both of those cabinets are from outside the US and both of them are under 14 alcohol. And uh, that's something, if, if you remember back to... The 60s, if you go back to the 60s and 70s, the Ingle Nooks and the BVs of the world, their alcohols were 12 for Cabernet. I'm not suggesting that we make Cabernet 12 alcohol because when Kim Jong un drops a nuclear bomb, we run to the bunker and we stay there for 15 years, those wines might gradually soften. <laughs> we, uh, we're kind of a more of a now society. And uh, anyway, and then we came prune. I keep them on skins for three weeks because one of the big things for me is to keep the wines in the you know how wines go from purple to red to brown to orange, especially at total beverage? Well, we only want to have our wines go purple and red. We don't want them to go brown or orange. And so I do a lot of manipulation on the skins to make that happen. So the story, uh, let's just make sure I've got this right. Okay, so the, the story goes for Yardstick is this is a, this is a mockery at the – uh, unfortunately, this is a mockery of the Americans and the British because there's only two countries in the world left that use right. the imperial system, and that's the British and Americans. And the British and Americans can't even agree on the same size of a gallon because a British gallon is 4.5 litres and an American gallon is 3.1. So he's come and do. Anyway, so the British and Americans got together and they sent this, this um, satellite out to Mars for the cost of $1.8 billion. You guys remember the story? It was about 10 years ago. It arrived at Mars and disappeared. No, I'm fine. I'll, I'll wait until whatever's got to be done. And it disappeared. So um, the British called the Americans up and said, hey, dude, I thought you said left-hand thread. And the Americans went, I thought you were talking metric. <laughs> $1.8 billion crater in Mars. So the yard is the old form of measurement for distance, if you recall. It's three feet. And that's a mockery that... Napa is the old form of measurement for quality of Cabernet. Get over it, man. There are other places to make that we make Cabernet. Alexander Valley, obviously, Maipo, McLaren Vale, Uko. I mean, a lot of other places. But anyway, we've got a lot of Napa Cabernet to sell as well, so don't get me wrong. Um, and then Ruth is the name of my sister, and I was brought up in a very strict English family where you know, your knife and fork were in, the, in your correct hands. None of the switching hands like I see some people do. Um, your, your fork's going to be in the palm of your hand. It's, you can only have your finger on it. You're not allowed to have to be touching the knife. Your water glass is above your fork and your wine glass is above your right, uh, above your knife. And you're not allowed to ask for anything. If you needed something else to eat, the people had to notice and it was passed to you. But not my sister. She just used to reach across the table. So that's where the name Ruth Reach comes from. So the vineyard itself is uh, unique in that it's at Shandon. Uh, Simi used to be owned by Shandon Winery. So when you drive into the Shandon Winery, you'll notice there's probably 20, 30 rows of Pinot Noir and, and Chardonnay because that's what champagne is made from. But the other 1,800 rows of Cabernet. <laughs> I never knew that. Because Yonville is better for Cabernet than it is for Chardonnay and Pinot. So they have the big vineyards down in Caneros. And um, they, uh, they planted this other area for Simi. And so I've continued to buy fruit from that same place. So uh, 
Yeah, so Donville is a little bit cooler than Oakville. Obviously, uh, Rutherford is warm. So it goes. I know it sounds funny that it's it's warmer to the south, uh, to the north, than it is to the south. But basically, it goes Saint Helena, Rutherford, Oakville, Yonville, Napa. Well, you got Oak Knoll in there too. I don't know what the hell Oak Knoll is, but um, so this comes from uh, Yonville. It's just a little bit cooler than Oakville. Uh, yeah, so I really like the wine. It's very fleshy, very ripe. We don't really talk about this wine very much. Um, we mainly talk about our, our big boys. So um, it was an interesting wine to choose, Brock. Hope you liked it. Yeah, does everybody like it? Well, I haven't even poured it yet. People so. on mute. Mm -hmm. You have to ask to unmute. It's mm, I think it wakes up. The people on the phone, they have to ask to unmute because I muted them. They were, they were being a bit raucous. 10 four. Um, I, I have a question, Nick. Like I I'm seeing a lot of your wines are um vegan. And is is that for for some sort of a marketing purpose or is that for um a, a stylistic purpose? No, I, I just think the, the more I mean we could talk all day about organic, biodynamic, natural, sustainability, blah blah blah. I just think. The, the two big things that I'm against are herbicides. Um, and, but, you know, it's funny that people will go to the shop and buy organic and then they come home and put Roundup on their weeds. Sure. I mean, come on, man. I mean, the world's <laughs> biggest user of Roundup are the home gardener. Yeah. But they don't want to bend over and pull out a weed, but they want everyone in agriculture to do so. <laughs> the number two user, of course, is the councils because they use it on children's playgrounds and railway lines. I mean, agriculture is a distant third. As far as vegan, ve it's a very interesting concept, this vegan thing, because it's unnecessary. But the reason why we've got two, two things to blame the Greeks for. Number one, they invented a cork. If they'd invented a screw cap, we'd be used to drinking reduced wines rather than oxidized <laughs> wines. And the second thing they invented was this thing called Isinglass. And what happened was the Greeks would put their wine on a, they didn't have any way to store wine. So they had these fish, these sturgeon fish, and these sturgeon have a large bladder in them. And they'd put the wine in the bladder and they'd sail across the ocean. And when it got to the port, they opened up the, the bladder and the wine was clear. It had lost all its haziness. And so some Greek guy thought, oh, this is pretty cool. So he got a bunch of sturgeon fish and he cut the bladders up and threw them in the wine. And sure enough, it produced a natural fining agent. And then they said, hey, well, why don't we do other things? So they started adding milk and blood and just other liquids to wine. And, and each one of these things basically settled out the wine and made the wine clearer. I don't think it's necessary. So I choose not to use any animal products in our wines, although most people do. It's even very famous wineries that you know today are not vegan. And that's why people are resisting to put it on their labels because it's... Um, it's, it's actually a disadvantage. The, the disadvantage is the clarity, but I choose, and, and if you don't clarify wines, most people filter, and we don't filter either. So we just use temperature and time as our clarifiers. But I think it's, I think it's an important concept, and I think, I think it's important that, that we move on from, it's, it's unnecessary. We can, we can do other things to to um, clarify wine rather than using filtration or so, so, you, so you feel that it, it rushes the process and yeah you're and, yeah exactly i mean if you drink bag and box of cheap wine of course it's going to have fining and filter but i mean i've got there's i've got very famous neighbors down the road here who my son who's a winemaker he worked there he couldn't believe it they're still adding egg white i mean all of the french wines use egg whites i mean there's very few bordeaux that would be vegan is it who he works for right now? Sorry? Is it who he works for right now? No, he works for a famous winery down the street here. But yeah. I can't tell you who it is because I don't want to throw them under the bus. I, I, I follow him. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Understood. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So, so the next. How, the next oh, I'm sorry. Right. How much more time does it take to clarify when you were, if you're using time as clarification, would you say is this like 20% more time or what, what, what would you say? Yeah, good question. So it depends if it's, um, if it's in barrel, you can imagine a barrel is a, is a very small vessel versus a tank. 
So if you're in a tank, it takes a long time for the solids to settle down, whereas in a barrel, it only has to pass a, a small distance. And then it depends on pectin. <laughs> so how much skin contact you give it. So a white wine is going to take a longer time to clarify than a red sure. one. So uh, we, we do have to use a thing called bentonite, which is an earth. We, with white wine, we do put earth yep. into the wine. I know it sounds crazy, but if we did not do that, you would end up with Chardonnay with lots of cotton wool in it. It's a pectinase. It break in it, and the alcohol breaks it down. So there's a thing called um, uh, bentonite, which is mined out of Australia. So we actually, it's very efficient. We only add like one drop for for basically a well, we add one pound per thousand gallons, which is a tiny amount. But um, yeah, so to answer the question, it depends on what vessel it's in and what variety it is. So uh, a cabernet is going to take a lot less time to settle than a than a Chardonnay. But then again, you normally leave Cabernet in barrel for a year longer than you would Chardonnay as well. And it, oh, and if it goes through winter, if it goes through winter, it's going to settle. That temperature actually helps it settle out as well. Thank you. Okay, so the um, the we're gonna we're only going to show one of the daughter wines today, and that's Hillary. Hello. And Hillary's our youngest daughter. You saw a quick flash of her. So she is one of these class of twenty twenty kids. Which will, life will never be the same. Uh, the school was wiped out by a flood in 2017 and destroyed by a fire in 2019. But they never graduated. They never had their prom. They never. And she's spending her first year at university, social distance, uh, you know, um, here at home as well. So, um, but I, I started making wine with my children back in 2000 when I was living in Chile, when Pinochet was running Chile. I don't know if you guys remember Pinochet. The Pinochet was a dictator, and the way you control people is by cutting off food, oil, power, whatever you choose to do. And he would cut off electricity, so it's pretty hard to make wine without electricity. So we'd get one generator, or maybe run the press, or pump a tank, or whatever. But if we wanted to add yeast to a tank or something, we'd have to light a fire and get hot water. And so I was telling my children about this, and they're like, "Yeah, right, Dad, whatever, mate." And I'm like, "Yeah, you can make wine without electricity." So we st in 2000, we started making wine without power. So we went to the vineyard, and we we handy stemmed, you know, taking, we picked the grapes, we hand, we de, we pulled the, the grapes off the cluster, the rakers, we pijaged, we punched down, we basket pressed, we hand pumped it to the barrel. I mean, it's um, a very laborious process. The um, But we did it and we made a barrel and we call it five gold hands for my five children, Goldschmidt, unplugged, no electricity. So uh, in 2001, Chelsea, my oldest daughter, wanted to get involved and so the label, so the label uh, for Chelsea is, is uh, when she was two, I traced her in the head and she colored it in, and that's where the label comes from. And then we started making Catherine, which I don't have a bottle of Catherine, but Catherine and Hillary, which I happen to have, they face the same direction. And if I put Catherine in the middle, she faces the other direction because Catherine's the middle child. She's the liar, the manipulator, the bullshit artist, thinks outside the box. <laughs> Yeah, so you see Catherine faces the other way. You all know what middle children are like. And it's funny. I'm married to a middle child, you know, and, and you tell them that, yeah, you, you know, you and then they go, no, 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 we're the peacemakers, we're the love. Yeah, you're the bloody manipulators. That's what you are. You manipulate people. Not like us righteous firstborns and lastborns. We all know where the action's at. So, oh, God. <laughs> who's a middle child? Glad we all just got here together. Yeah, of course, middle children, they're the first people to tell you they're a middle child. <laughs> well, they have to stake a claim to something. Oh, my God. Painful. <laughs> Brock, um, are you a middle child? No, I'm I'm a baby, of course. Uh, perfect in every way. Well, how could I not have noticed that? Stop how could so I long. have not guessed that? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I always, uh, there was, there was, there's a story I often tell. I don't know if we have time, but I'll tell you a bit of it. But one day I got a call from my wife and all I hear is, you know, all I hear is this, right? Uh, honey, I'm too drunk. I can't go to the parent teacher night at school. <laughs> okay. This is every father's, this is every father's worst nightmare, right? Because it's a lose-lose situation. You go to school and you complain. It's going to go straight to the headmaster, back to your wife and your toast. So, 
uh, I went along, but it happened to be a world. It was a life changing experience. It's a screw star signs, man. It's all about birth order. They break the room up on first, second, third, twins, and last born. So I'm sitting at the big boy table, and of course, you know what first borns are like, right? The um, there's a piece of paper on the table, and the first borns are straight to the task. We don't say hello. We don't make eye contact. We go straight to the task. The second, and, and then at the bottom, it said, elect a spokesperson for the group, right? I'm like, well, and you firstborns know this. You wait 10, 15 seconds. If no one volunteers, you volunteer. That's what firstborns do. The secondborns are like, hey, dude, can we get a firstborn over here? <laughs> the middle children are like, what was the question? Because, you know, the middle children, they're all still talking about themselves. <laughs> and the lastborns are like, we ordered a cheeseburger. We don't even know why we're here. You know, because everybody moved on. And, and I see it. I see it in my children all the time. And uh, so making wine with my children is, is fascinating. So when you when when I'm making wine with Chelsea, everything has to be perfect, first born. Second born, everything is perfect except for one thing. She always wants to put more tannin. So when I drink the Catherine, I always know when I finish the taste, I can taste Catherine's influence because she always wants to build the palate. She always wants to have that... You know, I, I want you to un, I want you to feel the wine. I want you to taste the wine. So it's more significant. And then with Hillary, you know, last last born, right? It's hard to get them to focus. A little bit of this, a little bit of that, a little bit of a little bit of that. You know, so and I see that in the wine as well, and it's quite fascinating. So anyway, I'm going to show you a quick video of where this vineyard is. This is Hillary, class of 2020. Uh, this is uh, Highway 29, uh, Saint Lena. This is, um, that's Faniente. This is Mondavi. That's Nickel Nickel. That's Opus. And that's Napa Wine Company, which used to be Inglenook. And so you can see between Opus and Nickel Nickel, here's the vineyard. Why would you spend $380 on, a, on a, something that's really expensive when you can buy something that's on a similar, similar location kind of thing? So um, anyway, enough said. There is the beautiful Nickel Nickel Winery and their vineyard and that's Hillary down there at that end and there's Opus, beautiful Opus, out here in the Oakville getting ready to pick Hillary tomorrow. Cabernet Sauvignon, Oakville, Napa Valley. Here in the beautiful old vineyard in Oakville, this is the charming vineyard that we use for Hillary. Just a beautiful old vineyard. You can see we use permanent cover. We don't do any weed spraying. You can still see that the weeds are underneath all the vines. We do this because we have good water holder capacity, nice water penetration when it does rain, and also a buildup of organic matter. Just a beautiful old vineyard out here in the heart of Oakville, planted to the old trellis system that they used to use. So yeah, I thought it was... Um, Question? Yeah. Okay, good. I like the yardstick and the Hillary both very much, but one of them nearly knocked me out of my chair because I love it. Like, love it, love it. So could you tell me what the, the difference, besides what I taste on my palate, what's the difference between the way the yardstick tastes and Hillary? Case. So you what got are the, the dynamics? Have you got the 2016 or the 17, Hillary? Uh, the 2007. I don't know. Okay. So and the and the yardstick is the 2018, right? Um, that's the 2017. Oh, you got old. two 17s. Yeah. Okay. So um, yeah, because I've got the 17 Hillary and the 18 yardstick here, yeah. but so you've got two vintages that are the same. So that's you can rule that out, but 17 is going to be a vintage that's going to show the terroir. I'm not a big, I'm not a big believer in the term terroir because I don't really, once we invented irrigation, terroir became irrelevant, but you will get more differences between the vineyards with 2017, whereas 2018 is going to be much fleshier and flasher and you won't get the diversity. So what you're basically tasting is the difference between Yontville and Oakville. So, Yontville is going to have a little bit more clay in the soil. You get a little bit more water holder capacity. So it's going to be a little, for me, I find the yardstick's going to be juicier, red, more red. Like we, when, we, when we talk about fruit, we talk about red fruit and black fruit. 
Alexander Valley typically is is um, red cherry, plum, blueberry, whereas Napa Valley is a bit cooler. You get blueberry, black cherry. But with the yardstick, you're going to get a little bit more of the red fruit elements that you would typically get in the Alexander Valley purely because it's on the clay soil. With the Oakville, with the Hillary, it's a more free draining soil. Plus, the vines are about 20 years older. So for me, those vines are much more balanced. You're going to get a little bit more black fruit and the tannins are going to be a bit more grainy in in the Hillary. Does that kind of make sense? Nick, yeah, it does. Napa's warmer or cooler than Alexander Valley? Warmer. Warmer. But we're comparing Yonville to Oakville. Yonville's cooler than Oakville. Yeah, sorry, Linda. Oh, that's right. I wish to say that, well, I found the yardstick very appealing to my palate. It was a, a little more vibrant. Um, maybe, I don't want to say the word sharp, but definitely more powerful. But the Hillary knocked my socks off. Yeah, no, this is just, awesome. Yeah, sharp is sharp is a good word. Um, what what I, what you're saying is you're going to get more acidity in the in the yardstick. You're going to get more acidity because it's got more clay, and so it doesn't ripen the same as is more of a, a gravelly lime, which is what the Hillary is on. So it'll it'll hold its acidity better in the yardstick than it does in the Hillary. So yeah, Hillary is very fla uh, flashy and rich and and everything else. Well, you know, you're yeah. paying twenty thirty dollars more a bottle too. And 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 right. as Nick was alluding to earlier, uh, for all you to know and everybody here, um, you know, Hillary's neighbors are you know selling for ten times the amount that Hillary is. And, you know, I've, I've tasted them all. And I, I just think that Hillary is just an absolutely exceptional bottle of wine. Um, and, you know, we're, we're blessed that he's making it at, at this price. Um, Nick, Nick, uh, when you're making a Cabernet, uh, you know, especially as we're, we're walking up from Hillary on uh, oh. for the tasting that we're having, um, what type of can can you have like a uh, like an aging potential? Like, do you want them all to age a certain amount, or I, I know you want them to to be you know drinkable when you release them? Um, but is is there some some way that you feel that way? No, I no no not at all. I I, I think that every wine, every vineyard, every I mean, I could I could take an hour to answer this question, but I mean, this okay. is why we make wine. I mean. Every vintage is different. I mean, with beer, you get to talk about beer once. Yeah. Because what I'm going to, you know, I used to be a brewer for three years. You know, what I'm going to do tomorrow is the same as what I did today, which will be the same as what I do yesterday, you know, which was what I did yesterday. The same beer is boring. You get to make it once. The key with beer is to make it the same. I don't want to drink the same shit every day. <laughs> with wine, you get the differences. You know, I gave, when I was the chief winemaker allied to me, I gave five winemakers, very famous winemakers, 10 tons of grapes from the same vineyard. And at the end of the year, the five, the six of us sat down and we drank the wine. The wines couldn't be more different. One of them was, one of them was almost undrinkable. And the other four were completely different as well. So here you are with the same ingredients, same knowledge, same abilities, and yet the product is completely different. And that's the beautiful thing about wine. So how do they age? Well, you know, they age from purple to red to brown to orange. Sure. I'm sure that our wines go purple to red. And I, you know, I thought it was funny. The wine enthusiasts came out with the 40 best winemakers under 40 years old. They're exactly the wines I'm not going to drink. Because when Kim Jong-un drops a nuclear bomb, we run to the bunker. Why would you take a bottle of wine from a winemaker that's only 40 years old? He hasn't even made wine for 10 years, let alone five from the same vineyard. I can show you the yardstick that I made in 1995 and it's still red. So I know it's going to age. I can show you the, the forefathers cabinet that I made in 1990 and it's still red. So when someone says to me, how long is your wine going to last? Well, you know, when the winemakers say, they say, oh, I'm going to last 25 years. I'm like, prove it. Man. Have you made wine from that vineyard for 25 years? You know, sure. so it's like, I don't know, man. It's, like, it's a bill. It's a life's a box of chocolates. <laughs> <laughs> no. 
<laughs> so you got to stick. Question. You got to stick with the people that you know and the places and the wines that you've tried previously. And the other thing is too, we drink it. You know, like the best Gruner Veltlinger was. I was sitting on the on the on the river bank in Amsterdam, and I mean in um, in Austria and uh, in Vienna, and it was the best Gruner I've ever had. When I came back here and drank it, I like tastes like shit. So. <laughs> It depends on who you, where you are, and who you're with, and you know, it's everything else that goes into into that as well. Whereas with beer, I'm just like working out: is it cold enough? Right. <laughs> yes, Linda. that's a pretty good point. <laughs> oh, I, sorry to interrupt. I just want, first of all, wanted to thank you for the explanation between the Arctic and the Hillary. I can assure you that if there were bottles of the Hillary. In my house, the aging question would be a moot point. <laughs> Brock, that yeah. first course was excellent. Awesome. Excellent. Thank you. Awesome. So We're gonna, much. It, it better from here. Mara's <laughs> actually and eating cauliflower, which is yeah, me too. a miracle. It's a Valentine's Day miracle. <laughs> <laughs> Delicious. Which oh, is better the, than a massacre. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. It's way better. I mean, except if you're cauliflower, then it is a massacre. <laughs> yeah, Linda, well. Linda, Linda, there's great news. <laughs> when, when you buy wine, it comes in a 12 pack. <laughs> so, there are 12 months in the no, year. No. Oh. Yeah, drink one. Of, um, you can drink one bottle per month and then just call me on which month you like the best, you know? Well, as, as Brock all knows, Linda doesn't order in anything other than six, but mostly the case. And then it will be one bottle per night. Yes. <laughs> so. So your 12 won't last a year. Yeah. And also, Nick, I just want to say, I really appreciate how plain spoken you are. I really appreciate that you're like real people. You talk the way I talk. I hear you. And thank you so much for being here today. In case I don't get the chance. No problem. Well, I, I was thinking, I, I thought it was funny, you know, during this COVID crisis, I've been thinking about, you know, the average white guy lives to 84. And I'm 58. So 84 minus 58 leaves me with 19,700 days. So if I drink, one bad bottle of wine, that's like throwing a good one against the wall. I just don't have enough time. However, <laughs> living at home with four children, you know, we're drinking four or five bottles a night. So I'm actually ahead of the curve. So we've sucked through a thousand bottles of wine during COVID. And um, it's been very thought provoking. So instead of 19,700 bottles, I should be able to hit over 20,000. <laughs> Holy cow. I'm actually um, a little surprised that with that amount of consumption, uh, or consumption, you actually had thought to provoke. Because really, if you're drinking four or five bottles of wine a night, I don't know what kind of thoughts you're having. <laughs> I don't. No, I'm not drinking four or five bottles of wine a night. I'm drinking like three oh, yeah. glasses. I'm just sharing it amongst so many people. <laughs> Oh, well, that makes a difference. <laughs> we don't all think there? like you, Linda. We don't all think like you. Check your, blood, check your liver, honey. <laughs> yeah. I'm the ultimate wine consumer. Spoken <laughs> like, like, like a true... You open the bottle, it's yours, baby. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Gary goes to get a glass, and I'm like, what are you doing? He's like, I'm getting a glass of wine. I'm like, no, open your own. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. Would you say the best time to visit your winery would be late summer, early fall, or next week? Well, there's two, there's two choices. If you come in October, September, October, of course, it's packed. Um well, usually, if you come now, obviously you get full attention. There's no one around. But um, uh, I'm a little bit different, so I'm I'm All leaving. Right. The Next week it is. I'm, well, I'm, leave <laughs> I'm leaving the I'm leaving the country tomorrow on Thursday. 
Oh. Where are you going? Well, the southern hemisphere is picking grapes, so I got to get down to the southern hemisphere. You're gonna South pick America? some grapes? Chile. Yeah, I'll be in Chile. I'm oh, not going to go to Argentina. The Argentinian, it's too dangerous to get to Argentina. So they'll they'll send me all the samples to Chile. And then if I um, can finish my vaccine, I will go to New Zealand probably. But New Zealand right now is impossible to get into. Mm -hmm. They're careful. That's all right, you ready? Mm -hmm. yeah. Where do we get up to? Uh, we got up to comparing. Uh, uh, so this was Hillary. the... Thing, but the, the 17 just got a uh, the only score we've got so far is suckling just gave it a 91 so it's it's um i, I think the 17 is better than the 16 myself but just the uh 16 got all these 93s which i thought was pretty funny because very rarely do all the magazines give the same score so it was um it's like it was kind of like a best value. Why couldn't someone give it a 94? No, everyone had to give it a 93. It's pretty funny. So, this is really funny because Hillary is a, um, she's a, uh, she's doing a degree in um, uh, one of the engineerings. She's a, or um, environmental, she's doing environmental engineering. So, I've been look, trust me, I've been blending for forty years, and she's arguing with me the difference between 30, 30 mils and seventy mils. Yeah. It's like, come on, but I mean, that's totally the last born scenario, right? Hey. So the key thing about the Hillary is it's just old. Old vineyard, its location is fantastic. It's an old selection, like we talked about earlier. And then uh, we pick it three different ways, which we're not going to go into right now. The next one we're going to talk about is four farm. So, this is the Alexander Valley. Or I'm just going to put you on, I'm just going to put you on mute. You can unmute whenever you want. Um, so, this is the Alexander Valley. Oh, it's Denise that's making Who's making the noise? <laughs> okay, so there, this is the Alexander Valley. This is the Russian River. This is the Fitch, this is Fitch Mountain. This is Healdsburg. I'm sitting at this blue dot now, and I live where the red dot is. This is Dry Creek. This is Alexander Valley. This is Russian River over here, as I said. And these are most of the vineyards. But the sun comes in this direction. So these slopes here are east facing, which makes them fairly interesting. These ones down here are west facing, but. Um, we we farm these on little knolls, and you'll see you'll see a picture of the Yeoman Vineyard in a minute. But the Lone Tree comes from a vineyard up to the north. It's east facing. It's dry farmed. It sits well above the valley. And Cloverdale is sort of the top of the Alexander Valley, and Healdsburg is the southern part of the Alexander Valley. And the Russian River used to form the Napa Valley, but there was a earthquake, and Mount Saint Lena was lifted up, and that's why the um, the Russian River now flows out to the coast here. Uh, the forefathers has got a number of elements. So when I was working for LVMH, when I was at CME, they put me in charge of still wine blending from around the world. And one of those wineries was Cloudy Bay. And one day I'm on a plane to Cloudy Bay going, what in New Zealand? Why am I going to Chard Why am I going to New Zealand to make Chard Cap, Malo, Savvy, Riesling? When you think Sauvignon Blanc for me, Marlborough is the best in the world. McLaren Vale in Australia for Shiraz, Uco Valley in Argentina for Melbeck, and Cabernet for California. So forefathers means the forefather appellation for that variety in the new world. This is before layer cake, cupcake, and all the other cakes. This is single vineyard, single varietal, single vintage. The second thing on the label you'll notice is this is a pair of my boots. Uh, these are boots that I used to wear when I walked around Simi because I'm a vineyard guy. Faded out writing is my constitution. When I became an American citizen, I wrote my own constitution about sustainability, fish-friendly farming, and not using herbicides. And that's the signature on the label is John Hancock's signature. I stole from the constitution and changed to my own. And Lone Tree is the name of the vineyard. There's a picture of the vineyard. This is actually the Zinfandel down here. The Cabernet yeah. is at the top of the hill and then um, goes further over. It's harder to see. But it sits above the valley. This is the Alexander Valley. That's Mount St. Helena. I tried to take this photo here where the fog sits in the valley in the morning. And then we're, we're usually in the sunshine at the top of the hill. And then this is a irrigated berry. So this vineyard is dry farm. So this berry is from Catherine's vineyard, the Catherine vineyard. 
And this berry is from Forefathers, which is dry farm. So you can see there's a huge difference in the size of the berry. And because of that, you get more skin to pulp ratio. So it's going to be a lot more rich and powerful than, than this. But the yield, as you can see, is tiny. So each shoot normally produces two clusters. But here, because it's dry farmed and old vine, it's only, you know, basically one cluster. Here's a little video you can see. There are so many things I love about the Lone Tree Vineyard, Alexander Valley Cabernet. I don't know where to begin. <laughs> uh, it's great, yeah. I love it. Just another beautiful day out here in the valley. And looking at close to the harvest, it, today is September 14th. So the things that make this vineyard great are obviously the soil. Uh, we have, I don't know if you can tell, and it has these stones throughout it, but it has at the same time this water holder capacity, which um, is important for Cabernet. We do not irrigate this vineyard, even though we have a drip line we ran. It's pretty heavily cropped. Well, actually, it's not. We have quite a few clusters, but the clusters are really small and really loose. Let's just look at one. So they're very loose. Look, a lot of Cabernet clusters can be tighter than this. The other thing that's really cool is the size of the berry. That berry is probably about 0.8 grams. So most Cabernet's about 0.95 grams. That one's about 0.8. Uh, so a lot smaller, and you can imagine the skin to pulp ratio. Different. Now that berry is not ripe for a number of reasons. The wine is split in the back when I squeezed it, so there's not separation from the pulp and the skin yet. And you can also see that the seed is relatively green still in there. What else I like about it is just these vines are just naturally balanced. And even though it's dry farm, we can, we can feel the leaf. The leaf to me still has good tannin, and it's still relatively cool. So even though we're in the morning here. Um, we have a little way to go in the day, but uh, these, these leaves are in a really good condition. I'll be able to take this breath through. I'm thinking this ideal is about 22 to 23 breaths. And I've just tested it. What do you think? Maybe I'll have to check it formally with them. I don't know if there's anyone down there. Anyway, another beautiful day out here in the Alexander Valley, northernmost vineyard that I have. We're up here at 800 feet. And um, just uh, did an awesome video at the Lone Tree Cabernet Vineyard in the Alexander Valley. All right, so the next one we're going to talk about is um, Game Ranch. So these are the, the top four Cabernets that we make. So the story goes back in um, 2000, 1999, CMU was sold to Constellation. They were worried that we were buying a lot of wineries, and so they wanted to do a sommelier tasting. So they invited 72 sommeliers to see me for three days. Half of them were MSs and MWs. And on day two, we did a tasting. I invited the winemaker from Larry Levine from Franciscan, Elias Fernandez from Schaefer, Rick Sayer from Rodney Strong and myself. And we both, we all spoke about the difference between Merlot and Cabernet. And then we poured eight wines, four Merlots and four Cabs and asked the 72 sommeliers to pick which two, which four were the Merlot and which four were the Cabernets? And guess what? Not one Somalia could tell the difference between Merlot and Cabernet. And if you guys think you can. And then we had a, the next day we had a tasting with um, Napa versus Sonoma. So from the Napa Valley, we had Opus, Mondavi, Franciscan, Camus, and um, uh, Phelps. And from the Alexander Valley, we had Lancaster, Jordan, Silver Oak. Um, Cyrus, Alexander, and Simi Reserve Cab. And same thing. 72 Psalms Listen to each winemaker speak, and then they got to pick which five were the Nappers and which five were the Alexander Valleys, and guess what? None. So then we had a vote. Who thinks wine number one's from Napa? Wine number two? Wine number three? Wine number four? Wine number three was voted most Napa. Simi Reserve Alexander Valley was voted most Napa by 72 Somalias. But the wine writers get it correct every day. It's amazing. Anyway, so we make these two wines exactly the same. We make one from uh, we make one from uh, the Napa Valley called Game Ranch, and then we make another one from the Alexander Valley called Yeoman, and we make them exactly the same. And uh, so we often do the tasting, and then we ask 
I normally pour two glasses of one and one of the other. And then I'll ask somebody like Brock, which one is, which two are the same and which one is different. And 80% of the buyers get it wrong. And then yeah. the 20% that are left, we ask them which one they prefer. And 80% of them prefer the one on the right, which I always have is the same wine. And when I unveil it, it's the Yeoman. And then they buy the wine on the left because it says Yokeville. Even though they prefer the Alexander Valley, they still buy the Oakville. So every That's year I take the Oakville up a buck just to piss people off. So um, the vineyard is, uh, let's go there now. So uh, these are the comparison of the two wines. Again, we go down uh, Highway 29. We go past the Hillary Vineyard. This is the Oakville Cross. And as we come down Oakville Cross, you'll pass Groth. That's Groth Winery. This is Plump Jack. That's Rudd. This is Gargiulio Rudd. This is Tench. It's a very famous um, uh, vineyard that goes into a lot of very famous wines. And this is Screaming Eagle. So Oakville is known for, you know, Groth, Plump Jack, Silver Oak, Opus, Mondavi, Scarecrow, Harlan, Maiden, Bond, Minor, Gargiulio, and Nick. So uh, you can imagine this vineyard just facing north, which you'll see here in a second, is a really unique site. So this is the vineyard we make ultimatum from the top. Game Ranch um, comes from the middle block, block three. And then we make another wine called Plus, which comes from the outside rows of both. Trouble hearing Nick. Trouble hearing. Can't hear the video. Nick, trouble hearing that. Nick. Brock, can you mention it to Nick? Sure. I don't think he can hear me. It's starting. Nick, there's a little little trouble hearing. And screaming eagle. And I didn't mention right over my shoulder. You might be able to see it. There is. is now, as well. I think it's coming through. Anyway, now. I know that uh, it's just a beautiful place to be. Game Ranch. We only make about 300 cases of it. It's one of my oldest vineyards. All of Oakville love being here as we head into the 2019 vintage. You can hear the cars roaring by for harvest here in Oakville. Check. So as you can see, we've just come through and suck it here today. Game Ranch, Oakville, Napa Valley. Beautiful thing. You can see we don't have any herbicide. You can see that we've got grassy or dried grass. That means the vines is all done by hand. And we have beautiful open closures up here on this steep hillside. That's Plump Jack. You can just see through the vineyard there. Beautiful green condition as we've finished set. And we'll be looking for parades on. That'll be the next step. So just a beautiful, nice, open canopy out here in the Game Ranch vineyard. Just swung around. This is the afternoon side. Sorry, the morning side, what am I talking about? This is the morning side, so a little bit more open on the morning side than the afternoon side because we want a bit more shading on the afternoon side. Hopefully you can see the difference. Anyway, beautiful. Game Ranch, recently suckered out here in Oakville. Have a night. So yeah, pretty unique vineyard and um, being so steep, as I alluded to, it's all done by hand. Uh, it's all hand weed whacked and uh, obviously we can't get tractors in there anyway and let alone, you know, we haven't used herbicides in that vineyard since it was planted. So just a great vineyard and pretty special location and it's, it's the only knoll in Oakville as well. So other famous places that are part of Oakville, of course, is Tokalone, Tokalone, which is over by Mondavi and then um, um, Richard Hill. 
which is the other side. So you've got Pritchard Hill on one side, Tokelone on the other, and everything else in Oakville is flat except for this one little knoll. And that's why all the famous wineries around that little bump. So very beautiful spot. Yeah. Any questions? So the last wine Susan's holding up um, is the plus. And so we do four things that are different and it's alluded to on the back of the label, but the main thing is it stays in barrel for a year longer, uh, which is, which is the, what are you doing, Susan? You're getting a workout. What's going on? <laughs> um, so yeah, it stays in barrel a year longer, but the, and the other three things, are the important thing. So it comes from the outside rows. So the outside rows of the vineyard, don't have any competition. So they tend to produce more canopy and less crops. So they're undercropped. And so I typically pick them earlier than I do the rest of the block. The third thing is the way the volatile acidity increases is a bit boring, but basically when I worked at Penfolds, the secret of our grange is how the VA evolves. So VA is a blend of ethyl acetate and acetic acid. And um, the way you get it through time, gradually, you can see at the end of four years in barrel, I can see the ethyl acetate or the acetic acid. But if we can get it to increase quickly in the first three months, it's much more complex. So it's a much more risky process, but the end result is fantastic. And then the last step is the way I take it out of the tank. So it takes me a couple of days to take the wine out of the tank, and that's sort of the proprietary piece. But uh, anyway, I think what the end result is you just have this big, the most complex wine that I could ever imagine um, making. And so we, we only make three to four barrels in any particular year. So uh, I'm going to show you the vineyard. So the Yeoman Vineyard sits above, it's an old terraced vineyard, it sits above the Catherine Vineyard. And um, this is sort of describes the volatile acidity. So VA gradually increases in barrel, but the way we induce it is we get it to increase very quickly in the first three months. And then at the end of four years, it's, it's very, very balanced and very sophisticated. This is my favorite top vineyard. Nick, we're having troubles hearing that. Nick, can you hear me? Nick? Nick. I don't think he's... Can you say something, Rob? Yeah. Nick? But luckily they didn't use AXR1. So these vines are well the, over 30 years old. There we go. We've been making them for The other thing that's really cool is the size of the berries. Uh, they're nice and small. We can see that we've got good lignification here now. So we're almost close to harvest. The other thing I like about it is cane pruned. So this is last year's wood. And so these shoots are well spaced. We don't get the spur positions like... Um, like many vineyards do, they do spur pruning where you get two shoots and then get a lot more congestion. Whereas this pruning technique is far more relevant for high quality and as far as I'm concerned. The other cool thing, it's a terrace vineyard, so it's not straight lines across, it's planted on the contour. And these roots face um, east to the northeast, so it's a relatively cool location as well. Anyway, this is the beautiful Yeoman Vineyard. I hope you get to try the wine. Yeoman Gulch Group out here in the Alexander Valley. So then we do a, we make a plus wine from both the Yeoman and the Game Ranch, and um, they typically score close. Um, 92, although the, I don't know. Anyway, whatever. We just had a little bit of a blanket run there. And if you come out to... Um, Dry Creek, uh, we have a little tasting room out there. And if you come to Healdsburg, we're about two miles out of town. We have a little tasting room there. And if you want to follow us on social media, the best way to follow us is on Goldschmidt underscore Vineyards, where if, um, I probably post two, three videos a week on that site. If you want to follow us there, or of course, you'll be able to get us on um, Goldschmidt Vineyards on YouTube. There's about 2,000 videos up on YouTube now. And um, Facebook 
it's okay. I just I use that to feed in from from Instagram, but that's how to get a hold of us. And um, oh, what did I put here? Yeah, I, so, I, I have, uh, yeah. One question, Nick. Um, I mean, you mentioned very briefly. Sorry, that, I can't hear you, Brock. What's going on? I'm sorry. Can you hear me now? Are you muted, Brock? Brock? Susan? Can you hear? I can, but we had troubles hearing your videos. And Good. we were trying to let you know, but you didn't hear us. There you go. That's all good. Can, can you hear me now, Nick? Yeah, I can hear you. Awesome. Um, I, I, I think you, you very briefly um, mentioned uh, a proprietal, uh, proprietal process on how you do Goldschmidt Plus. Um, and, and I think that is so overlooked. Um, how many other winemakers know about this secret process that you use to make this last wine? Because I mean, all, all you all, like you really need to focus on this last wine because I, I, I feel that it's very rare to taste something like this. So how, if, do you know how, how many other winemakers in the world know about this well, process? That you know about yeah, I I mentioned, I, I didn't think it was that special when I figured it out. I thought other people must have been doing it. And so I, I mentioned it to a wine writer once and he published it. And the next day I got two phone calls from wine guys over in Napa going, welcome to the club, shut the hell up. And um, <laughs> the, those wines sell for over a thousand bucks each. And then of course, because I make, I don't own a winery. So I make this wine up at a at a winery up here and um, that winemaker started doing it as well. So there's, I know there's four of us doing this practice. I've heard of one other guy talking about it. So I don't know if he figured it out yet. Um, so the maximum, so let's say there's 1200 wineries between Napa and Sonoma. There's probably five of us doing this technique. That's awesome. I mean, it's not. That, yeah. And that, that, I mean, it brings it back to the conversation that I was bringing up with, uh, you know, Hillary with, you know, all, all your favorite, all your famous neighbors. Um, I mean, your plus wines are unparalleled and especially at the price point that you do it at. And, um, I personally am very gracious that, that you do it and, uh, you allow us to have events like this, um, you know, with, with friends and, you know, packed rooms that there's no way that we would ever be able to, to do this with, uh, those other four makers. Yeah. I think. I, it's, it's funny that like when I, when I'm out on the road and I'm talking about wines and stuff and, and I show Catherine and Hillary, people don't understand that the value of Hillary, I mean, you should not be able to buy that wine for under $200. And then I get to game ranch and game ranch plus and everyone goes, Oh man, that's expensive. I'm like, no, the it's game not. ranch, the game ranch is still the third best value in all of Napa and all of Oakville. So Hillary's the best value, then Mondavi Reserve Oakville, and then Game Ranch. And Game Ranch Plus is still, I mean, when you talk about my neighbors, I mean, it's ridiculous how cheaply we sell these wines for. So, and I, and I often, and, and we know this, I sent a wine to a wine writer four times, same wine. This was done when I was a corporate winemaker years ago. Same wine writer received four bottles of wine with different labels and different prices. Same wine. And he scored them all based on price. Sure. And yeah, and that's, and that's something that I, I think everybody should, um, I mean, look into. I mean, it's, it's wonderful to read all these magazines and, uh, you know, read the scores and, and, and things like that. But there are thousands of dollars that are are put into a winemaker you know giving you a nice score you know and things like that and you know that's why you know gray goose is you know so much more money than tito's because you know the marketing you know same thing with you know um you know vuv clicot to um you know just a, a wonderful alexander valley um sparkling um they spend so much money to make themselves look good in magazines that you are not getting the quality of wine that we are having here today. And I, I, I just really want everybody here to, uh, to know that fact. I'd like to add as well, um, this Nick only makes four barrels of this in each vintage of AV and Oakville. So the AV Yeoman, Wisconsin actually only gets 
two to three six packs of each Alexander Valley and Yeoman. So this is very small and allocated and rare and it will sell her for a long time as well. So just, you can get both Oakville and AV today. We're having the AV plus, but we wanted you to know how small batch and rare it is. 42 months on Oak, beautiful. You know, we have a, we have a Hillary that's 2015 and we have on our, our seller notes that it's best to drink that between 2025 and 2028. And, um, and, and so the cellaring idea or thoughts on this, I'd be interested in your thoughts on that whole idea of cellaring because we have, we have this that we're waiting to drink, but we want to know what you think about that. Oh, I don't believe in age. I just, I just drank. That's what I said. <laughs> That's what I said. You know, um, you buy, you got to buy a whole, you got to buy 12 bottles. So you drink one a month. There you go. Yeah, do we I mean, have to wait till 2025? And then during quite a month in 2025. <laughs> All right, then buy, then open one every six months. <laughs> but you know, that's the, you know, so during this COVID time, I mean, I've been drinking my cellar of all, you know, because when I buy wines, I buy wine because I'm, I'm a bit unique, of course. So when I buy a wine, I buy a wine for the story or the person because I know the person or I know the vineyard or whatever. And then, you know, like if I'm in a restaurant, that's the way I order wine. I don't order wine based on a label. I mean, the last thing I want to do is buy an expensive bottle of wine at a restaurant and plonk it on the table so everyone can see what I'm drinking. <laughs> that is so irrelevant. Well, I mean, no one's seeing what we're drinking right now. <laughs> you go to a restaurant to try something new, you know? So... And then if I don't know anybody on the wine list, if I don't know one of the wine writers, then I'll choose a vineyard area that I know or an appellation that I know or, um, you know, work my way down the list. As I said, the last thing I do is buy a trophy wine. Why would I do that? I mean, that's, you're just overpaying. As Brock said, you just, you're paying for all the marketing and, <clears throat> and a score, score running that they've been doing, you know, so it's a waste of time. There's always, there's always a value on the wine list. You just got to find it. Yeah. Yeah, and that's and that's what that's what I mean, Nick. That's what you do. I mean, we, we I feel bad that we skipped over Catherine. With I feel bad that we skipped over Catherine, um, which is one of my favorite wines. But I, I felt that we are also familiar with it already. That you know, we'll just you know, move over it. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm so so happy and glad that we were able to uh, go into these other wines that many of us are not quite as familiar with. Um, being so familiar with your portfolio and uh, taking the time with us today on Valentine's Day. I know that you were probably pruning this morning. You'll be jumping back in the vineyard right after, right after we're leaving. So uh, thank you. Thank you so, so much. This is just amazing. No problem. But just Yay! an honor to be with you guys. So thank thank you, you, Brock, Courthouse Pub, all 